This is lesson six of our series on prayer. And we're going to talk today about asking God, praying for God to deliver us out of a situation we're in or to fix things that we can't seem to fix ourselves. And that's really the purpose of this passage from Jonah. And we're going to look at that today uh, through Jonah chapter two, mostly, although I'll review pretty much the whole book. So for this lesson, think about the prayers you pray when you're in a situation and have no idea what to do with it. It might be a situation of your own making or one that you just fell into as part of being in this world and trying to walk through this life. Sometimes we have problems with our health. Sometimes uh, we have family concerns that we want to pray and ask God to fix. Sometimes we're praying for someone else who has trials or concerns. I wrote a book not too long ago and I called it A Great Calm. Because for all of us, there are times in our life when we find ourselves in the middle of a storm that we can't fix. And so we have to ask Jesus to speak into that storm, his words. Uh, can he pull us out of it? Can he fix it? That's the prayers we're going to talk about today. And I love the, the reason I called my book. A great calm is because when the disciples woke Jesus up, who was sleeping in the bow of the boat, he stood up and spoke to the storm that had arisen on the Sea of Galilee. And then scripture says that after he spoke, there was a great calm. And so I want to talk about what it is to pray for that, for that deliverance, uh, that great calm that God can bring into our lives, even in the storms sometimes. The book of Jonah is an interesting story in our, in our Bibles, and I call it a story because it reads like a story, although I absolutely believe Jonah was a real person, and what we read in the book of Jonah are the events of his life. The book of Jonah is located in the Minor Prophets because Jonah was a prophet to the northern kingdom before the Assyrian armies came in to capture them. And the Assyrian armies were advancing on Israel at this time. And the people in northern kingdom, really throughout Israel, were afraid. The Assyrians were a people to be greatly feared. They were known for being evil and dangerous, and they were a threat to everything Israel had known. And God calls Jonah into the battle, so to speak, uh, in a way that Jonah does not want to respond to. Every now and then, God will call us to be part of something we would never have chosen to be part of. Maybe it's an argument, maybe it's a discussion, maybe it's a situation that we wouldn't have stepped into on our own, but God has woven our path to that place or even called us directly to speak into something. The book of Jonah would be a great place to go in before you speak during those times. The book of Jonah is a great lesson that sometimes God asks us to do things we don't want to do or wouldn't choose to do, but that we need to respond as Jonah learned and benefit from his lessons rather than respond as he did. There's a simple outline I like to use for the book of Jonah. I say chapter one is Jonah running from God. Chapter two is Jonah running to God. Chapter three is Jonah running with God. And chapter four is Jonah running ahead of God. The lessons of chapter two teach us that our prayer often causes us to run to God. The needs in our life cause us to run to God. But sometimes we run to God wanting an answer to our prayers. 
And often, if not usually, it is the journey ahead of us that is the answer to our prayer. God will often fix things when we pray, but often he fixes them through the way that he's grown or adjusted our lives to know his will and to walk in his will. Jonah chapter one begins when God said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. The great city of Nineveh is spoken about in scripture, but it is also a city where there are amazing historical records, extra biblical records. Nineveh was a powerful, amazingly intelligent, capable culture. They were also known for their horrendous evil. They worshiped false gods. They were the most feared and hated enemy in the world of that day. You might say they were the ones that owned and wanted to use the worst of weapons. The wall of Nineveh was often papered or plastered with the corpses of their enemies, especially the leaders of their enemies. It was Nineveh's way of reminding anyone that would come against them what they were capable of and warning them away. The records are too dark to really even talk about. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against it. And so there's no surprise when verse three says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. If you look at a map, a biblical map, you can find Nineveh on the right side. You will find Tarshish as far to the left as they know they can get it. Jonah didn't just run. He ran as far away from his calling as he possibly could. There are times when God asks us to do things that we would never have considered for ourselves. Joshua was asked to take his people and cross the Jordan at flood stage. Moses was asked to take the nation of Israel across the Red Sea. Now we know the rest of the story, but they didn't when they stepped into the waters. There are times God will ask you to do something or be part of something that you don't wanna do. And the lessons from Jonah teach us why we actually want to walk with God, why we want to obey his calling, even when it's the last thing we feel like doing. The Lord sent a great wind to the sea and the sailors are terrified. Jonah is on a ship running to Tarshish when a great storm arises. And the storm is so awful, the sailors are terrified. But at this time, Jonah's in a deep sleep in the bottom of the boat, and the captain goes to get him. And he asks Jonah to call on his God. He uses, the scripture uses a small G word for God here, because the captain is not saying call on God. He's saying, whatever God you have, call on him, because we're in trouble. And the sailors then cast lots because they want to know who's causing this problem because then they know what to do about it. And the lots fall to Jonah through this casting of lots, which I'll be honest, I don't really understand. The sailors come to believe it's Jonah's fault that they are facing this horrible storm they can't control. And Jonah looks at them and says, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah looks at them and says, I'm a Hebrew. The God I worshiped made this storm, this sea and made the dry land. And it says the sailors were even more terrified because they already knew Jonah was running away, disobeying 
his God. And the sea got rougher and rougher, and the sailors try to throw cargo overboard. But Jonah tells them, you're going to need to throw me into the water instead. And they try not to, and then they do as Jonah asks, begging him, begging Jonah's God to forgive them for what they're about to do. And the minute Jonah hit the sea, it grew calm. He hit the water, the sailors made a sacrifice and made vows to Jonah's God, recognizing that what they were seeing take place was the act of a true God. In verse 17 of chapter 1, it says, Now the Lord provided. And if you have your Bibles open, you ought to circle the word provided. The Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And from the inside of the fish, Jonah prayed to God. Sometimes we would look at what happened to Jonah as a punishment. Sometimes we look at what's happening in our lives as a punishment from God. A lot of the times, what may feel like a punishment is actually God's provision. And we need to step into Jonah's perspective here to recognize that. Has God provided the difficulties for a reason? Jonah then, in the belly of the fish, prays a prayer for asking God to deliver his life. But if you look at it carefully, you see the intricacies of his prayer, and you see his acceptance of whatever it is God plans to do. Jonah says, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths and into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me, and all your waves and breakers swept over me. And I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. Jonah believed his life was over. Jonah knew that he was in a circumstance that was a result of his own disobedience, his own doing. Jonah knew that the only thing he really should expect was death. And yet, Jonah says to the Lord, I will see your temple again. Even in all of his disobedience, even enduring his punishment and discipline, even recognizing that God had provided for him and his life through that fish, he didn't yet know the ultimate outcome, but he did know this. He knew it would be heaven. He knew he would see God's temple again. Jonah says, to the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath it barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. I'm wondering if I'm speaking to someone today who has been to that pit in their lives. And you might have felt like you hit rock bottom as a result of your choices or just having wandered from God. There is no place where God cannot provide for your need. And I want you to see that in Jonah's life right now. He sunk to the bottom and God provided a fish. God can reach us 
wherever we are. Never doubt that. Stand on the assurance of God's word that God will find his children. And if you are a Christian saved because of your faith in Jesus Christ as God's son, there is no place, no mistake, no sin that can keep you from the sure and certain knowledge that you will see God's temple in heaven. Jonah wrote, when my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. When you pray, even from the pits, your prayer rises. The book of Revelation describes it as incense that rises up to heaven and it's stored, your prayers are stored in a bowl that God holds in his hand. When you bow before the Lord to pray, picture your prayers rising to God's holy temple. Even in your trials, remember he is listening to your words. And then this seems like an out of place verse but it is not. Job describes his prayers rising to the holy temple of God. He says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. What did Job learn in the belly of the well? He learned that clinging to what we want can sometimes be a worthless idol. Clinging to what we fear can sometimes make our fears an idol. Why? Because we allow them to control our choices. Anything that controls your choices instead of God can be considered an idol in your life. It can be a good thing. All the things we have and own, our bank account can be an idol. So can our fears. Anything that controls our choice and causes us to run from God and his will can be an idol. But when you come to a place where you're at the end of yourself and you realize what I chased was not what God wanted for me, you can praise the Lord like Jonah did with shouts of gratitude. And you can go back to him and sacrifice your own life for your calling. That's what Jonah did. And he says, what I have vowed, I will make good. What did he vow? Jonah was a prophet. He was someone who had vowed to speak the word of God. And that's the vow he had run from when he ran to Tarshish. And the minute he turns he is now running to God and with God. Jonah's testimony has God's answers. Jonah says, I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. That fish was provision. He carried Jonah back to a place where he could Fulfill his vow to the Lord. Jonah said, I will go and tell those Ninevites that salvation comes from the Lord. So why do we face trials in our own lives? Or why does God sometimes need to direct us back to his path? We need to pray for that opportunity. When we know we've run the other way, we need to ask God to carry us back. Hopefully it won't be in the belly of a fish, but I'm not here to say that it'll always be a nice trip. 
back to the place where we can serve God again. But when you go back to that place where once again you can fulfill God's calling, that will be your joy. Like Job, we live in a fallen world and it has evil in it. Like Jonah, our own choices have consequences and sometimes our life is full of consequences that someone else put upon us because of their choice. But regardless, we can know that God wants to restore and redeem us to a place where we can once again tell the world, tell those around us, use our influence to help people know who God is and that salvation is available to anyone through the Lord. James chapter 1 verse 12 says, blessed is the man, blessed is the person who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. What's the great lesson of Jonah's prayer? I found a quote that I want to give you. It's a long one, but to me, it's the essence of of the lesson Job learned in the belly of the fish. Colin Smith writes, Lord, make me less like Jonah and more like Jesus. What did he mean by that? Jonah ran first. Jonah fled. Jonah walked away from God in order to learn that he needed to walk with God. We want to be more like Jesus who got up every day knowing that his day was about serving his Father in heaven. He knew what to do with that day because God told him what to do, moment to moment. Jesus walked with God while he was here on earth. He submitted his kingship to God's authority while he was here in an earthly body. We need to be more like Jesus and not like Jonah. I put it this way, try not to learn your lessons the hard way. The quote goes on from Colin Smith. He writes, save me from being the kind of person who cares more about my comfort, my reputation and my success than I do about the people you are calling me to serve. Help me to keep all of my dreams on your altar and be ready at all times to respond with faith and obedience to your call. Isn't that a great prayer for all of us? So I close with that. And I leave that quote up there for you to see and read and pray through. May all of us spend our day like Jesus would want us to spend it and avoid those moments that would be more like Jonah's first choice. See you next time.